Good evening. You're very welcome, distinguished guests, colleagues, and students. Um, as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here in which law sits, it gives me great pleasure to, tonight to welcome you to the second lecture in what we've called our Distinguished Law Lecture Series at Liverpool Hope University. As you know, this series is being led by Justice Sir Mark Headley, who is a visiting professor here at Liverpool Hope. As I noted in our first lecture, Justice Headley will be known to many of you in the audience, given his standing and stature in the legal profession in the United Kingdom and indeed beyond. I'd like to say just a few words of introduction about Justice Headley, given that I know some of our audience tonight were not able to attend the first lecture. Justice Headley has had a distinguished legal career, having initially served as a judge in the Northern Circuit Court until he was appointed in 2002 to the High Court, where he served in the Family Division before he retired in 2013. He made history by being the first judge to allow journalists into the Court of Protection in May 2010. In his career, Justice Headley has passed judgments on a number of high-profile cases in the fields of criminal, family, end-of-life, medical and mental capacity law. In 2004, he ruled in the case of the premature baby, Charlotte Wyatt, deciding her life support machine should be turned off. He has, in many such cases, faced highly challenging and difficult issues. And I think we heard last week how, as a judge, he's acted in such manner. He's also appeared as an expert on ITD documentary series Exposure. He's been a visiting professor for the Judicial College, and he's currently an honorary professor of law at this university. Justice Headley is also a practicing Christian, an Anglican reader in St. Peter's Church in Everton, and Chancellor of the Anglican Diocese of Liverpool. In this series of lectures, he will focus on issues such as televised trials, the infallibility of truth, state intervention in people's private lives, and whether the role of judges is fit for purpose in today's society. In that first lecture two weeks ago, he focused on the modern judge, power, responsibility, and society's expectations. And I think he highlighted for us the dilemmas judges face and the expanding remit and requirements and things expected of them. So I think we've got a very good in, interesting insight into the role of the modern judge. In tonight's lecture, he's going to turn to focus on what is truth, the relationship between truth, proof, and justice. So really, with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to Justice Sir Mark Headley to give his second lecture. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for uh, coming tonight, and um, particularly to those of you who've come back for a second dose. And uh, that's greatly encouraging to me, and I hope uh, it will be uh, suitably rewarding for you. I said when I started this series that I wanted to talk frankly about judging, using as my model the trial judge, and in particular the use of the discretionary powers committed to trial judges in the field of family and mental capacity law. The aim is to highlight the trust that society has to invest in its judges and to ask two questions. First, what is the true extent of the powers that judges have today? And secondly, are they exercised with the informed consent of the society whom we serve? In the first lecture, I tried to show that any human legal system is inherently fallible, something to which we will indeed return today. I sought to show too that the primary function of the judge is to make binding and authoritative decisions in disputes between citizens and between citizens and the state. We considered also the conflict between privacy and transparency in cases involving the private affairs of citizens and saw here 
as we will see again today and later in this series, that perfectly valid principles tend to pull in opposite directions, requiring either choice or compromise between them. So today, as um, the Dean said in his kind introduction, what is truth, the relationship between truth, proof, and justice? What is the purpose of a trial or an inquiry? Surely it is to get to the truth. That is why we have them. And when we want an inquiry that gets to the truth, we have a judicial inquiry. That is how it is seen. This is, of course, a proper and wholly legitimate aspiration for any society. But is it attainable? That is the question on which I want to concentrate. Truth is a difficult concept. Objective truth undoubtedly exists. The universe has its origins, its composition and its destiny, and so do we. The difficulty lies not in acknowledging that, but in accessing the truth that lies behind it in a much more modest and mundane context the same difficulty confronts the judge. Our system, like almost every other judicial system that has ever existed, is so constructed, as we have seen, that fallible judges hear and consider fallible evidence often given by very fallible witnesses. We should not be surprised that getting to the truth is easier said than done. Pontius Pilate's question to Jesus, what is truth, might be a much better one than he ever realized or indeed cared. At the same time, however hard we press the difficulties of obtaining the truth, no society should abandon the aspiration that that is the true object of a trial. The case is over. The witnesses have all been heard, the documents read, counsel listened to, all now eagerly await the coming judgment. Young barristers are often disappointed to discover that what is troubling the judge is not their learned submissions on the law, but the dispute over what actually happened in the case. It is at this point that the criminal judge breathes a sigh of relief and passes the baton on to the jury. As no research of jury deliberations is permitted, we can only guess at how they go about it. In all other cases, however, the judge must decide the facts. How then do they go about it? I'm not sure that, again, there is very much research on that. Our tradition puts a strong emphasis on seeing and hearing the witnesses, thereby acknowledging that in decision-making there is a real impressionistic and intuitive element. I have certainly found that to be so, and it's not always easy to express clearly why one has accepted one witness rather than another, other than that after reflection, One has preferred one to another, an explanation which happily the appellate courts have made clear is entirely acceptable. So I can only really tell you how I go about it, certainly rejecting the approach of an elderly magistrate some 40 years ago who said to me, only I fear half-jokingly, a look at their fingernails, dear. Mine is an approach that I commend to new family judges through my continuing association with the Judicial College. I will try to explain the approach in the context of a care case in which parents are said to have brought about the death of a child by shaking. Sadly, it's an allegation not unknown to me, and it is both emotive and controversial, but it serves to illustrate the purpose. The first step is promising. A large part of the evidence in any case is usually agreed or at least uncontroversial. 
I begin by assembling that evidence to see whether, as is often the case, it offers both context and background to the case, and even an indicator of where the probabilities might lie. Thus, in our imaginary case, it is accepted that the child was at home when she suddenly became ill. The parents had been having a hard time with sleeping and feeding, but had regularly taken the child to the clinic without adverse comment. The child had been promptly taken to hospital when she fell ill, but despite best efforts there, had died. The post-mortem examination found a particular triad of injuries, often associated with a shaking injury, but not itself diagnostic of it. Had the child been shaken? If so, was it in the care of the parents? And if so, who had done it? The controversial matters have to be assessed in the context of the agreed evidence. In this case, there will be one or two people who know the actual truth as to what happened, but the judge will not be one of them. The judge must then make an assessment of the witnesses. Are they honest? Are they accurate? Are they reliable? It may surprise you to know that even after 30 years of listening to witnesses, I still start with the assumption that I am being told the truth in the sense that what the witness is telling me, she actually believes to be true. There are perhaps three common indicators of dishonest evidence. Evidence that is tinged with malice, evidence that is inconsistent with the agreed background, and evidence that is inconsistent with what that witness has said before. So one parent blaming the other for a shaking when they're in the midst of an acrimonious separation and an acrimonious battle over who should look after the other children will always ring alarm bells. Evidence of calm deliberation and reaction when the child forms ill, when the child falls ill, when the background demonstrates a chaotic family life may do likewise, as may uh, an account given to the court which is at serious variance with what had first been said in the ambulance or at the hospital. None of these matters prove dishonesty, but they cause alarm bells to ring. And even if the judge were to conclude that the witness was dishonest, it's important to ask why. Of course, usually it will be to cover up personal wrongdoing. But it may be a fear of reprisal, a desire to protect somebody else, or even simply an inability to face up to the fact that parenting had gone seriously amiss. A conclusion, however, that the witness is honest is only the start of the process. They may be honest, but are they accurate? Are they reliable? There was an interesting piece of research done, I think by the AA, in which innocent bystanders were gathered together and shown a video of a car crash. And they were then asked to describe what they had seen. And the variations in the description were such that one wondered if they'd all been watching the same video. I have listened to honest parents describing their family life but whose perceptions were so fixed and so blinkered that I actually wondered if they really did live in the same household. You may get the truth. You may even get nothing but the truth. But the whole truth is something of a rarity. However, at the same time, for example, the parent's account of how the baby became ill may actually fit into the context of the undisputed evidence and give a real clue, for example, that they were seriously under pressure at the time. It is at this point that the judge has to factor in the expert evidence. Now, I don't intend to repeat what I said last time about expert evidence, but that too has to be evaluated 
before a judge can decide what, if any, light it sheds on the issues that need to be decided, especially where that evidence does not speak with one voice, and especially where that evidence may be tainted by prejudice or bias. As I mentioned last time, that can be quite a problem in baby-shaking cases. Throughout this process, it is necessary to bear in mind the real distinction between an honest witness and a reliable witness. An honest witness may be very convincing, but also very mistaken. The classic case is identification. I may be utterly convinced that it was X I saw who hit Y, only for it to be demonstrated that X was in Australia at the time. It was just someone who looked like X, and because I thought I knew X, I thought it was X. We've all made mistakes of this type, sometimes with very embarrassing results. But because we are honest and convinced, we may therefore give very convincing evidence which doesn't make it any more accurate for being convincing. There may be a further complication with which the judge has to cope. A, a classic modern example are the allegations of historic sexual abuse which have littered the newspapers for the last three or four years. Now, I've had to try many of those cases, both as a criminal and a care judge, and they do present serious difficulties. We know now that these allegations may take a long time to materialize. Victims suppress them in the hope of forgetting them or out of fear that they will not be believed or because they continue under the influence of the abuser. It's not unusual in my experience in family cases for allegations first to be made when the person concerned realizes it's now their own child who is at risk from the person who abused them. There are obvious difficulties in assessing accuracy when witnesses are describing events that are said to have happened up to 50 years ago. The central event may be clear enough, but even that, if continuously relived in the mind, may itself become distorted. Certainly all the surrounding circumstances are likely to have faded or become confused. The position of the person accused, if innocent, is even more difficult. Their evidence will in all respects be identical to the evidence of a guilty liar, because the guilty liar has probably taught himself to believe in the truth of the denial and thus, as I mentioned before, may appear convincing. It is, of course, right that the guilty should be held accountable irrespective of the passage of time. But it is also right that every accused person should have a fair trial. So, all the evidence has been assembled and considered. Now the judge must turn to the disputed question. Was this baby shaken? Or was this person indeed abused when they were young? If so, by whom? Well, sometimes the answer is obvious. All the evidence points one way and the outcome is not in doubt. That, however, is not how it seems in most cases at this stage. It is at this point that we encounter the concept of proof, which is, of course, itself a creation of human thought. And the concept of proof applies much more widely than in the courtroom. The scientist, in propounding a theory, uses judgment based on proof. Newton's laws of motion were accepted as true and proved because they explained all the visible evidence of motion. 
or at least they did, until we discovered the subatomic world in which things happen very differently. Now, we do not abandon Newton because his laws still explain everything that you and I can actually see. But they are not the whole truth. We are all content to accept something that explains what we see, even if it is not absolute truth. And that's rather the position that we find ourselves in the courtroom. The actual task laid on the judge is to determine what has been proved. The burden of proof usually lies on the one who asserts. So the prosecution in a criminal case, the local authority in a care case, must prove that the baby was shaken, and if so, that it was at the hands of the parents or either of them. However, at this point, the criminal and civil jurisdictions divide sharply over the standard of proof. In a criminal case, a person may not be convicted unless, in the modern phrase, the jury is sure of guilt, or, in the more traditional phrase, the jury is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt. In a criminal trial, the focus is on the alleged guilt of the defendant. Did he do the act with which he is charged? Thus, a verdict of not guilty may carry very different messages from he is innocent right the way through to, well, we think it likely he did it, but we can't be quite sure. Because the jury give no reasons, no one knows where on that spectrum any one verdict actually lies. All that a verdict of not guilty does is establish, is uh, demonstrate that the presumption of innocence has not been rebutted. The position in a civil case, a family case, a mental capacity case, whatever, is quite different. There, proof is only on the balance of probabilities. There is no doubt that this child has died. Is it more probable than not? that the cause was shaking? If so, is it more probable than not that this was done by a parent? And if so, by which or both? It is not a case of am I sure this baby was shaken or am I sure which parent did it? It is a quite different test on the balance of probabilities. And this was spelt out in 2008 in a House of Lords case with remorseless logic by Lord Hoffman. And he said this, If a legal rule requires a fact to be proved, a fact in issue, a judge or jury must decide whether or not it happened. There is no room for a finding that it might have happened. The law operates a binary system in which the only values are zero and one. The act either happened or it did not. If the tribunal is left in doubt, the doubt is resolved by the rule that one party or other carries the burden of proof. If the party who bears the burden of proof fails to discharge it, a value of zero is returned and the fact is treated as not having happened. If he does discharge it, the value of one is returned, and the fact is treated as having happened. Now, the result in the family court is this. The case, in all its respects, including the future of surviving children and yet-to-be-born children, has to be managed on the factual basis of the findings made on the basis that the dead child was or was not shaken and was or was not shaken by a parent depending on whether that fact was proved or not. Thus, in a shaking case, if the parents are found on the balance of probabilities to be culpable, the future of surviving and yet-to-be-born siblings has to be decided on that basis. If it is not proved 
the children's future must be decided on the basis that the parents were without blame for the death. One of the reasons for this difference in standard of proof is the consequence of error. In a criminal case, if the convicted defendant, the, the convicted defendant would go to prison, but if acquitted, will be set free. And it has long been a principle in our society that it is better that the guilty be acquitted than that the innocent be convicted. That is why there is a high standard of proof. But the purpose of a family hearing is, however, the protection and welfare of children. Of course, if parents are wrongly found to have shaken or abused their children, they are likely to lose them to adoption by strangers. That would be a very serious injustice, as the media have pointed out perfectly properly from time to time. However, if wrongly they are found not to have shaken the child when in fact they had, then surviving siblings and the yet to be born are exposed to grave risk and danger. The Supreme Court has pointed out that there is a real danger in an error either way, something that hardly has to be impressed on the anxious trial judge. Now, one consequence of this, as the astute amongst you will already have noted, is that exactly opposite results on identical evidence may logically be reached in a criminal and family court. The jury may not have been sure that the baby had been shaken or been shaken by the ch person charged before them and have thus returned a verdict of not guilty. On the self-same evidence, a judge may conclude in care proceedings that the child was shaken and that the parents were culpable because that is the more probable explanation of the totality of the evidence. Indeed, uh, there was a case in Liverpool of an alleged indecent assault in which I found myself as the criminal trial judge. And it was an allegation that a stepfather had indecently assaulted his 14-year-old stepdaughter. At the criminal trial, the jury acquitted. But there were then subsequent family proceedings in which the same issue arose and by a rather complicated set of circumstances I shan't trouble you with, I found myself as the family judge as well. And I made a finding that the assault had occurred and that um, that was at the heart of the family case. Now, I could well understand, having sat through the criminal trial, why the jury would not have been sure. But for me, the assault was the more probable explanation of the totality of the evidence. Now this is all um, perfectly logical to a lawyer, although I rather suspect it may not be to everyone or indeed anyone else. I've expressed the view in two reported cases that there ought to be an attempt at consistency between the family and criminal courts, at least to the extent that a jury should not be invited to convict where a family court has declared the allegation unproved. However, the Court of Appeal, comprising both the then Lord Chief Justice and the then President of the Family Division, has made it clear that that view is wrong. The criminal and care systems are wholly separate, and what is decided in one cannot be binding in the other. That clearly is now the law, and we have to live with this rather puzzling paradox of different conclusions on the same evidence, both being lawful which, of course, raises the question, well, what is the relationship between proof and truth? And how does that relate to any acceptable concept of justice? In the examples that I've just given you, it simply is not possible for both results, however sound in law each may individually be, to be the truth. Either there was an assault or there wasn't. Either there was a shaking or there wasn't. 
Uh, I have to say that uh, long as I've puzzled over this and many a case as I've sat through with it, I've come to the conclusion that this is probably an inescapable dilemma. We trust that if a matter is proved, it will be true. Indeed, our system is only politically and morally acceptable on that basis. We know, however, that if something is not proved, it does not mean to say that it has been shown to be untrue. It simply has not been proved. Now, in order to confront this dilemma of proof and truth, we need to set our consideration in the wider context of social justice. We saw last time that the purpose of the judiciary is to bring finality to disputes between citizens or between citizens and the state by the giving of a final binding and authoritative decision. Judges are not there to discuss, speculate or even lecture, but to decide. The judge who fails to decide fails in his most basic social function. I said at the beginning that our system is constructed on the basis of fallible judges evaluating fallible evidence given by all too often very fallible witnesses. I trust that in this lecture I have at least made good that assertion. It is also the case that whoever might know the actual truth of a particular fact, and there normally will be those who know the truth of it, it will not be the judge. The combination of those factors, the need for a decision, the fallibility of the process and the elusiveness of the truth mean that the whole process is seriously and inevitably open to error. Social justice is deeply human, but would we actually want it otherwise? It is sometimes tempting to assert that discovering the truth, something which we all too often have to do, is just a matter of common sense. Would that it were so. Human experience, however, teaches us that human ingenuity is almost limitless when it comes to skewing human relationships and making human life difficult. I have long lost count of the cases that I have heard in which the facts, if tended to, tendered to a publisher of novels, would be rejected as being beyond belief. Human life is often much more complicated than even the imagination of the novelist allows. Truth is truly often stranger than fiction. I try to confront this dilemma with new judges by suggesting, as I mentioned last time, that the two qualities most needed by the family judge are humility and confidence. Humility is essential once we appreciate the inherent fallibility of the system. And humility requires courage. The courage to acknowledge that however hard we try and however conscientiously we apply ourselves, we are going to get some cases wrong. What is more, we will rarely, if ever, discover which ones they are. At the same time, each judge needs confidence. How otherwise can a decision in these circumstances be made? And the advice I tend to leave them with is this. Approach every case with humility, decide every case with confidence, and then sleep well so you can do it again and again. Truth is, of course, foundational to justice, but so is the resolution of disputes. The job can only be done with the human tools that we have. Thus, if it is better to do the job than to abandon it, we may have to accept, in answer to my basic question, that the whole pure truth is not always accessible. It was surely in recognition of that that the concept of proof was first devised. Proof is our protection against human error, 
and our recognition that we cannot directly read the hearts, minds and consciences of those who appear before us. In ancient civilizations, and Jewish and Roman civilizations would be good examples, it was actually very difficult to obtain the conviction of a free man if the prescribed due processes were in fact followed. There is nothing new about the problem we confront. Read the Mishnah or the Talmud, read Cicero, and you will find it all there. Now, we have certainly made matters more difficult for ourselves in this country by having two standards of proof. Of course, we value the presumption of innocence, but we also value the protection of children, and they do not always pull in the same direction. Those are indicators as to why we have two standards though I dare say there are others too. Could we do it better than we do? Of course, we could and should ensure that proof and truth more exactly coincide. However, the inherent contradictions and fallibilities of our judicial system, not to mention the activities of those anxious to avoid the truth at all costs, probably mean that things cannot be done radically differently. We commit to judges both great power and great responsibility in the individual case, and we do so in the full knowledge of the inherent fallibility of any human system of justice. Thus, if we are to have a politically and morally acceptable system, we must have an incorrupt, well-trained and independent judiciary who enjoy the trust of the community. That, of course, is the issue that underlines this whole series and to which we will return in future lectures. Next time, I want to consider the ways in which the state can and does intervene in private family life, and in particular, the role of the judges as gatekeepers and regulators of that intervention. But all further discussion uh, of the role of the judge has to be seen against the background of the tensions that exist between proof and truth and the need to deliver justice which involves not just acting on the truth but producing a true decision in each case and the tensions that exist between those. Thank you all very much.